All right, welcome back to Making the Argument. And this episode today was actually brought to us by a member of our community on Circle. So we want to thank Kat for this recommendation. And I'm going to be honest, when I first saw the recommendation, I thought it was something of a critique. Like we had failed to address something in a bunch of episodes that we'd done previously. Because what Kat wants to know is, she's like, look, you guys have done a good job talking about some of the problems with modern feminism and dating and how hard it's been for guys out there. She goes, but what is, what about, what about all of us non 304s? What about, what about all of us non club girls who do want to be traditional wives and we do want to find, you know, traditional men and we are tired of being lumped in with the cast of the whatever podcast. Anytime the frustration kind of comes out on this podcast and she goes, can you please, please send some help to the gals out there that want to find the sort of guys you're talking about to build the sort of marriages and relationships and families that you guys consistently talk about and advocate for. So Kat, again, I had to read a couple of times. Tina had to come in and say, no, no, honey, this is, this is what she means. She's got a great point. We we need to address this. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank Tina for walking me through it and and having to woman'splain it to me. So I properly understood. So what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to go through this, this whole concept of, you know, dating in the 21st century, right? Like, you know, what do you want? How do you attract the sort of person that you're looking for? Where do you actually find them? Because that's changed as well. We're going to talk about things like what are the red flags that you absolutely have to look for? The deal breakers, which should shut everything down right away. And then we're going to ask the question, considering all of this, is it really possible in the world we currently find ourselves in? We're going to discuss all of that and more on this episode of Making the Argument Powered by Good Ranchers. Well, again, welcome everyone to this episode of Making the Argument. I am particularly interested in this topic because I'm on a mission to find my wife in 2024, so that is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, But thank you to everyone who has helped us choose the many options we've gone with for this episode and many more. Don't forget that in the Episode Ideas channel in our Circle Chat, uh, you can vote on ideas by clicking the up button and everything else. Uh, But let's get right into the show. All right. As always, I am your host, uh, Nick Freitas, trad husband. <laughs> With us today is my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. Hi, babe. Hello, everyone. And then, of course, we have a resident historian and political prognosticator, Master Hines. Um, I, how do I even introduce myself to this one? I just yeah, want to say that, that I was and- dragged I was dragged into this <laughs> under duress. I, I did not vote for this topic. No, I'm just kidding. No. It'll well, be a good episode. Cr- well, Christian sorry, we're, is a we're- fellow traveler on this quest. Uh, well, I yeah, don't care. I don't care, Christian, because guess what? This isn't mud democracy. <laughs> you just have to show up and participate. <laughs> I walked into that <laughs> and, one. And then, of course, we have Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into this. So obviously, as we're discussing this today, we're, we're again, uh, this was inspired by Kat from our community. She had some various questions that she had. We're going to try to get to some of those. Um, we're also going to be talking about this. Obviously, Tina is going to be sharing her perspective, um, you know, attacking this from a woman's perspective. I'm going to hit it from kind of the guy's perspective. And one of the ways that we wanted to do this was to talk uh, very, very briefly about how Tina and I met. So um, anybody that's been watching the show for a while probably has heard us tell this story before. So I'm going to give the condensed version. Uh, We met in high school, our freshman year of high school. We went to a very, very small school, like graduating class of 27. So again, for all of you who have been wondering, like, oh my gosh, like how did he manage to like convince her to marry him? It's she had a really, really small pool of uh, options. So and there I, it is. Make sure, young. so that's make sure it. you go to the you know? smallest pool possible. Marry the that's person right. right out of high school. <laughs> Done. Next episode. Hey, yeah. I'm kidding. Right? There we go. So there you go. You're <laughs> but welcome. That, that's one of the no, reasons we get so much criticism. Yeah. Uh, whenever we're saying, no, no, there's still good people out there. People will criticize us because we, we found each other young, but some of these principles I do think still apply. And so the, we're going to Touch on they that. do. And I, and I want, I want women. I, so again, because a woman inspired the show, I want to give women kind of, um, some insight into kind of the thought process men are going through. So when, when I was in high school, I'm sure this shocks nobody. Like I was, I was not a ladies man. I was not, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't date a lot. I didn't do any of that stuff. And, um, part of it, I mean, I think, and, and again, Tina was there the whole time. So she could probably tell you part of that was like, I, from a very early age, I really did believe that that dating was about finding someone that you were going to marry. I I didn't think it was something that you just kind of did for fun or for experimental purposes. Like I I really thought it was more like if you, if you can't possibly imagine yourself potentially being married to this person, 
why would you waste their time? Why would you waste yours? Why would you, you know, hurt somebody else? Why would you let them mess with you? And, um, and I, and I also, I, I had this kind of standard of like, you know, look, men are supposed to do certain things. We're supposed to open doors. We're supposed to be nice. We're supposed to be polite. We're supposed to be protectors. Like, and, and so that's kind of how I looked at things. And what I learned very early on, even at a, a small, you know, uh, Christian school was that was not rewarded, right? Like that, that was, that was not typically rewarded by, you know, the girls in, in the school or, you know, the, the ones I was attracted to or whatnot. Like that was my impression. Um, and, and so, and, and on top of that, what I also witnessed was, you know, some of my, uh, you know, some of my buddies, I had one buddy in, in particular that I felt like it was like, gosh, dang, man, like he treats, he treats girls horribly. Yeah. I promise not to and, name names, but he was like, this guy <laughs> was toxic. He was like the woman with the drama, but as a dude. And, um, but they and ate he it would up. make like, girls feel like he hated them one moment and make them feel all insecure. And then all of a sudden he would turn on the charm and they would all melt. And I always looked at it like, oh my gosh, these women are so weak. I can't believe they're falling for this garbage. But, well, but the thing is, is like, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's a, a buddy of mine. And I mean, T Tina gave a, a very, <laughs> it's kind of a harsh version of it, but no, not, un I gave not, an not untrue, version. not untrue, not <laughs> untrue. Um, and uh, so like I'm, I'm watching this and I remember like my freshman year, I'm watching it, my sophomore year, I'm watching it. And by my junior year, I was starting to get kind of like fed up with this. I'm like, this is garbage. Like I'm, I am, I am trying to be, and, and I ended up being not only like friend zoned, but I ended up being like, I like girls would talk to me, but I was the buddy, right? I was, I was the friend because I would listen and they thought I gave pretty decent advice, right? When, when, and stuff like that. So which, which if you're a friend zoned guy, sometimes that also makes you the rebound guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it was probably my junior year of high school where uh, honestly, my attitude was screw this. Like I, I was, I have been told that this is the proper and the chivalrous and the nice and the polite and all these other things to do. Um, you know, and, and on top of, you know, it's, it's, and I was like, I played sports and I did other stuff, like, but I'm like, this isn't working. And for a while there, I, I kind of got jaded. Um, I, I got jaded a little bit and there, there was this, there's this one episode I will never forget. There's this one episode where this, this one gal, really, really nice, um, totally cool, pretty gal and the whole deal. And, and I was just, you know what, forget this. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do what everybody else does. Like, I'm just going to, you know, kind of date for fun and, and not, and, and I remember like instantly feeling bad. Like it, it's not like anything happened or anything like that, but just like instantly feeling bad that I hurt somebody because I wasn't serious. And I remember thinking like, look, I don't know. I don't know what the rules are anymore. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I, I know this whole nice guy crap doesn't seem to be working. And I, and I don't, I just don't want to be the sort of guy that, um, you know, treats women in a way that's like flippant or, or disregards them or, um, you know, makes them think or, or potentially puts them in a position of think there's going to be more than there actually is. Like, I don't, I don't want to be either of those guys. And this is kind of my junior year. I'm having this uh, epiphany and then senior year, right? Like, cause Tina dated somebody else in high school. I had kind of like somebody else in high school. Um, but we, we had always been friends, but we like, she was kind of off with her group. I was off of mine. And we were senior, friends with a lot of tension. Yeah. We there used was to a lot of a lot. tension there. We used to argue a lot. Um, when I just thought she was way too hot for me. So like, Whatever. <laughs> but the, but the, 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 this is what's important about this story because of that stuff, which a lot of people look at what I just described and say, dude, that's not big baggage. That's not any of that other crap. Yeah, I know it is. I'm not claiming this is really bad. I'm just claiming, I'm just letting you know, it didn't take a lot for me to realize this sucks. I don't like it. And the moment like Tina and I started hanging out more and it started to become more evident that we liked each other. I was a lot more aloof. I was a lot more guarded. Um, like there was no way I was going to demonstrate uh, like a significant amount of affection. Like I was, I was being really, really close hold um, to the point that when I left for basic training, so we started dating um, kind of like late um, 1997, of our senior year, 97. Yeah. Late 97, we start dating. And then I leave for army basic training in June of 98. So like right at like two weeks after we graduate. And at that point, I'm pretty sure I'm just like in love with this girl. But there's but no he way in had hell never I'm told me that. I never told her that. There was no way I was going to tell her that because I had also 
I had also like I kept waiting for the other shoe to to fall, right? Like I kept waiting to find out that, hey, you know, idiot, you know, you really thought this this girl liked you when in reality, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, or I'm gonna go off to maybe she does really like me, but the moment I go off to basic training and I'm gone for like three months solid, like there's there's no way that there's a reason you know, there's a bunch of cadences about Jody taking your girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, understand something. When you when you Jody was Jody was like the name that everybody in the military gives to the guy that basically steals your girl when you're away at basic training, right? And so right before I leave for basic, I know I'm gonna be gone for like three months and um I'm trying to set myself up for two things. One, I'm trying to set myself like I don't want to get hurt. And two, I don't want to I don't want to feel like weak or vulnerable. And so I tell her right before I leave for basic, I'm like, look, I'm going to be gone for three months. If you want to date other people, you can. I'm clearly not going to be. <laughs> um, but I, I just and that made her mad. And I'll let her kind of describe that. But that made her mad. But the reason why I needed to say that is I needed to know that if she was going to stick with me all throughout basic training, it's because she was she was going to do that, that she she genuinely cared for me. And um, because that that was for me, that was going to be the proof that was going to be the proof that this was something that was that was going to last and was going to stand distance and stress and everything else or it wasn't. And I, I, I mean, as much as I didn't want it to happen, I'm like, oh, yeah, really like super hot girl in a college town because we were in Chico, California and Chico University was known for being like party school and the whole day. I'm like, there's like, how, I, you know, I barely stand a chance when I'm standing there. How am I going to stand a chance when I'm in Fort Benning, Georgia? And we can't call, we can't talk. All we can do is write letters. And we didn't even know what the frequency with that would be. Um, and so I told her that and I left and I remember going off to 30th AG in Fort Benning, Georgia and thinking to myself, Oh my gosh, like if she, if she steps out or if she does something like that, I'm just going to be devastated. I'm going to be absolutely devastated. And I got like one call with her early on at 30th AG and, you know, definitely a lot more affectionate you know, on that phone you call. Still, still didn't, didn't say I love you. Love me though. Still didn't say I love you. Cause I, again, I needed to know that that was, and she like for the first two weeks, we got no mail because they just, everything was getting figured out in the whole deal. But I, she wrote me every single day I was in basic training. And like at that point I was, you know, I was like, okay, wow, this is, and there's still a part of you that thinks, okay, but is it, is it real? Like you really wanted to believe it's real, but you got as, you know, sure. Week one, week two, week three, but all of a sudden you get into like week eight, week nine and buddies are getting dear John letters. And, you know, again, I never had to worry about that because there was never a break in the letters. I was getting a letter every day. telling me what she was doing, telling me that, you know, um, how much she missed me, the, the whole deal. That and, and my, that and like one of my best friends in the world, Eric Ewing, who is my, is Lily's godfather. Um, he, he was also there. That, there's actually a kind of funny story. He was also there to make sure that, you know, Tina wasn't like, I didn't put him up to that. He was just a good friend and looking out. And he was, he was like, yeah, man, she, yeah, super loyal. Um, but yeah, that's what, um, that's what really demonstrated to me. And I remember she flew out for basic training, uh, showed up and was just, oh my gosh, just, whoa smoking hot. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. But, but we, we go there, Move we along. go there and we were on the, we we're on the uh, banks of the river, the Chattahoochee about to go get a uh, dinner. And, and my folks were out there and Tina was out there. And that was the first time I told her I loved her. Um, and then we were married about six months later. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm just, I, I, I say that to kind of set the boundary of like what it was like for what it was like for us from kind of my perspective and why, um, what attracted me to Tina. And by the way, what attracted me to Tina was not just, was not just her looks. The other thing that really attracted me to Tina when we were in high school was, um, she had the ability to play the, um, she could have been the mean popular girl, super easy. Um, never took that route. Uh, never took that route. She was always like, she chose her friendships and she chose, uh, the things that she would do and the people that she would hang out. And, and what I thought felt to be a very, very genuine manner based off of, kind of the, the character of the people around her and whether or not they were genuine. She, she really didn't care about um, a lot of the stuff that people get caught up with like status in, in schools. And, um, and that really spoke to me. So there was the, there was the values, there was the integrity and then, yeah, there was the looks. I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but, um, but those things all factored in. And, and I, I talk about all of that to kind of lead into this first topic that we're going to hit. And that is, you know, all right, to the, to the uh, ladies out there, like, what do you want? Um, 
And, and I'm, I mean this very specific because it's one thing to say, oh, I just want a traditional husband or I want a real man or I want that. No, but what do you mean by that? Like, what, what do you want? And so, I mean, I'm going to hand this over to, to Tina here real quick and just kind of ask her, like, what were, what were you looking for? And when, what, you know, when, when we say traditional or we say masculine or we say stuff like that, what did that mean to you? Well, first of all, a lot of times if a woman's being really, really honest, and sometimes women won't be honest about that. She kind of wants you to play the guessing game and guess what she wants because she actually doesn't know what she wants either. And she's <laughs> hoping that you'll guess correctly and she'll get to recognize what she wants through your guess. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. There are but can times- you guys understand at least how unfair that feels to us? <laughs> no, I understand. Um, but but that's that's just it is sometimes our minds are so complex that we're struggling to weed out what society has told us we should want versus what we really want. And there is sort of a, um, let me explain this. Society has basically told women that you should want a guy that's going to cry with you and he's going to get all excited whenever you get your hair done and your nails done and he's going to compliment you on your shoes and notice all these things. The truth is guys don't typically notice that stuff. And we've, and we're told, oh, your guy doesn't care about you if he doesn't notice all this stuff. Um, and it's interesting because on the other side of it, you know, us women, we tend, we tend to try to weed out, okay, th- is this my thought or is this society's thought? Am I supposed to feel this way? Am I not supposed to feel this way? And ultimately really what it is, is we want a masculine man. And, um, and society, I feel like, has sort of trained us in our minds to um, look at things much more superficially and ignore our biological uh, responses to to men. Um, women, I mean, like you can even just look at uh, birth control, chemical birth control ha- is, you know, responsible for changing the way women see a man. Um, if she's on birth control, she will be more attracted to more feminine men and less attracted to masculine men. Um, And it has to do with what she smells through the pheromones, and it has to do with what's visually appealing to her. Because it's changed her hormones, she then is not as attracted to um, men that would be beneficial to her uh, reproductive (laughs) system. So, you know, when when you look at the way we're wired, you know, women have a tendency to want... Uh, someone that is strong where you're likely to have children that are going to be strong and keep the line going. I mean, that's kind of like the underlying thing. And society has really tried to train that out of us. And chemical birth control has also damaged women in this way and caused more feminine men on the other end of it. Because what happens is, um, you know, when, while we're trying to figure out what we want, we're we're ignoring our body. We're ignoring mm. our our own well, mind. Can I, let me so, let me ask you let me ask you something on that because this goes back to what you said when you said, "Well, look, if we're if sometimes if women are being honest, sometimes we just we don't we we can't fully articulate what it is that we want, or we haven't totally figured out what we want, and so sometimes we it's like men guess and like, oh yeah, that's I like that. So here's my question: Do you think a part of that has to do with the fact that? Two things are going on simultaneously. And I think this is some this is something that I don't think guys properly understand sometime. I didn't properly understand it until you and I were talking about this at one point. And that was at the same time society is punishing men for being more masculine, it's also telling women they're not supposed to like those masculine guys. Right. And so it's it's not just an attack on men, right? That attack on masculinity also ends up being an attack, at least socially. Um, with respect to trying to change women's expectations for w- what it is they're supposed to like, like you are, you are, you are being force fed a version of what you're supposed to like. You don't like it. It's not what you would naturally choose, but the social pressure is, can be overwhelming at times. Like, is that a, is that a fair description of that? I, I think so. And I also think that, um, when women are trying to figure out what they want in a man, she should not be on chemical birth control. Now this, I'm not, I I know this is like a crazy thought, but chemical birth or hormonal birth control is really bad for women on a lot of levels. It's, it's bad for your, so many things, cancer, um, blood clots, you know, how your mind works, your skin, your, 
aging process. It, it is bad for everything. So I'm not just saying this because I'm a Christian and I don't believe you should have sex before marriage. I am also saying this because chemical birth con- control is bad for you um, on a scientific level. And so I think women should not be on that while they're trying to figure out what they want because it screws with your head. And and I will tell you, I mean, a lot of women don't want to admit this, but hormonally, I mean, the week before our period, like we are freaking crazy <laughs> and we feel like everybody, listen, I'm just trying to tell you how strong hormones are yeah. is that in my mind, the week before the, my, you know, cycle like hits, I am looking at everybody like, why has everyone lost their minds? Everyone's just getting under my skin. Everything is irritating. Every little sound, every little smell. And I'm just like, ooh, I can't even stand myself right now. And it'll just suddenly click. And and this is how I am. And I encourage other women to be the same because we get really defensive when we shouldn't. Like women hate it when you're like, are you on your period? But honestly, <laughs> you guys, admit it. Like own it and, and, and address it because it's on you. It is on us to make sure we don't behave like psychopaths. And when we know that our period is coming, we need to go, you know what? Let me just let everybody in the house know. Um, I think I'm, I'm due for my period very soon. Um, I, I think I'm a little crazy right now. So if I'm really short with you, um, Maybe it's not your fault. It's probably my period. And that lets them know that maybe they should be careful with you, you know, and, and not be, you know, I'm going to go wash the dishes, prodding. babe. Okay. So the reason. What do you do if you're just always crazy? Well, that's you though. I mean, that's, I don't know. You got hormones. Cause I, I mean, we've done whole podcasts on how like all of society has gone insane. Well, so. I mean, keep, keep in mind, like everybody's doing stuff that messes with their hormones. So what my point is hormones are extremely strong. They can make you crazy. They can make you sick. They can make you hallucinate. They can make you do all kinds of crazy things if your hormones aren't really balanced. And so, of course, if you're taking hormonal birth control, it is going to alter the way you see the opposite sex. It just is, especially because it deals with your sexual reproductive uh, system. And so, I am saying, women, if you're trying to figure out what you really want in a man, like whether it's visual, whether it's, you know, his actions and things like that, you probably need to get off the hormonal birth control for a while and like get back to who you really are in order to so, recognize that. So that that's a good, I mean, that's a good first step. Obviously, don't, don't do stuff that's going to drastically inhibit y- your own judgment, um, you know, chemically when, yeah. when you're trying to find someone that you want to spend the rest of your life with. And then uh, on the other side of that, um, also be willing to kind of push back against the, the, be willing to push back against those, those social or cultural norms that you think are, you know, kind of like, we'll just say perverse, yeah. right? It, it's this idea of like, no, 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 you know, Hollywood is telling you you're not supposed to like that sort of guy. Um, and so that really is something that when we talk about, okay, what do you really want? I, I think that more and more, if, if you are more in that traditional, um, mold, right, that's, yeah. that's what you want. I think both sides have to understand that you are going to feel outside pressure that you're not supposed to feel that way. Exactly. You're going to feel that. And so you're going to have to consciously decide to, you know, kind of reject that and and push through with, with what it is that no, you want. Yeah. And I I will say that, you know, when we've, we've talked a lot about, okay, what Hamilton has something to say. Uh, Can we, I've got, (laughs) I've got something really good here as we're having this conversation about what women want. Okay. There's something that I noticed. Nick, you were going to go to basic training whether or not Tina wanted you to go. You were going to go to basic training whether or not she loved you or whether or not she was going to marry you. You were convinced that that was your path, the direction you were going to take in life. So I I have a thought here. Could it be that while potentially women may not know what they want in a man, what they definitely want is a man who knows what they want in life and who has a direction for their own life. I just wanted to propose that as a potential answer to this question based off of what y'all were saying. That's absolutely true, Hamilton. And, and to that effect, there are women who recognize that a guy is on a certain path 
And she doesn't like the path he's on, but she really likes the guy. So she tries really hard to pull him off that path. And I will say this. If you aren't cut out to be a military wife, don't you dare do it. Don't do it. The reason I say this is because he's on a path. He has this duty-bound thing in him. You are not going to... It's not that you can't get him to come off of that path and do what you want, but he will resent you for that, and you will lose respect for him because he didn't follow through, and he didn't do what originally attracted you to him in the first place was that sense of duty. And so, um, man, recognize what you want and see if you're up to the task. Like some jobs that men have are service-oriented jobs, and they take a certain type of woman. If you are really needy, if you are high-maintenance, you need to recognize that about yourself. And yeah, you can adjust that. Like I, I'm a really big fan of women recognizing that we have faults too. And there are areas where I could do better. And I think we should be willing to change things about ourselves that are um, more negative, things that are are maybe they're um, kind of negative quirks or whatever. We should be willing to work on those for the people that we love. This whole idea that like, I'm not changing for any man, blah, blah, blah. That's toxic. That's garbage. There are so many things I have changed in order to try to be a better wife for Nick because it benefits both of us. So, you know, it's it's like that basically this whole idea of, of for instance, me recognizing when I'm hormonal and crazy <laughs> I have chosen that I'm going to I'm going to recognize this and I'm going to do the work to not take that out on my family. And women sometimes get this idea that since I'm, you know, uh, since it's that time of the month, I I have carte blanche to just be a B word to everybody. And that's not okay. You cannot be a monster for one week out of the month every single month. That's, that is not okay to your family. So you have to rein that in and control it. So anyway, um, but I absolutely agree that women do want a man that's on a track because, um, ultimately a traditional woman wants a man who is going to be able to support her and their children and be able to raise them. Um, you know, I don't think necessarily anybody needs to be super wealthy, but you do need to be able to feed your family, put a roof over their heads, and um, and have a, a close knit family unit like that. And and um, I, well, I, I, think I think that's important. To, I think that's a really good observation, Hamilton, because it comes down to um, you know Tina is very, like Tina's very like knows her own mind, you know, strong willed, the whole deal. And and I don't say those things as pejoratives. I, I say them as as positives, the things that uh, attracted me to her. Um, but Tina also. It, expects me to lead. <laughs> like if I, if I'm not leading in a certain area for which she expects that, that, that has an effect. Yeah. And so I, I think one of the things that, um, w- one of the things that, you know, you, you hear this mentioned sometimes, and I think it's absolutely true. And, and it goes to the heart of this question. What do you really want? If you really want a man that leads, that's going to include sacrifice. Um, and, and Tina had to sacrifice a lot because of the first 10 years, 11 years of our marriage, I was gone for roughly half of it over that time between training, between schools, between uh, deployments, between combat deployments. I mean, I was gone a lot Mm -hmm. and, and look, I, you know, I, I, I ended up volunteering for more combat deployments than I actually got to go on. I remember one time her looking at me like, did you just volunteer to go to Afghanistan? I'm like, yeah, babe, I did, but I don't think they're going to let me. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, um, and again, I, I didn't always do that the best way either. Right. Like I'm not telling, I, I don't want to give the impression that it's okay, guy, just go do what your mission is. And she's just supposed to tag along and keep the home fires burning. Um, but before we were dating or before we were uh, married or engaged or anything like that, I had decided I was going to join the military. It was very, very important to me from a service perspective, from a proving myself perspective, from a patriotism perspective, like add it, add up the reasons I had a lot. And, um, and I was going to do that. And, and I do, I think, I think it's right as much as Tina might've appreciated that, Oh, he wants to spend more time with me. So he's not going to go. She would have been disappointed. And, and I think it's an important thing to understand that is that this is not a question. So many times we, we, we frame the argument as uh, me or this, or if I was a higher priority then then he would do this. And, and I, I, 
I want it to be understood. I didn't go off to the military in spite of Tina. I, I went off the military in part because this was something that I felt like I needed to do both personally and professionally to be worthy of her. Well, right? it like wasn't it, just that. It was it was also that um, honor and duty, your commitment to. Well, but that's but that's the point I'm trying to make mm-hmm. is that this this is not a either or proposition. And if if you get in this habit of believing that, well, if he has to go to this or if he's spending time doing this um, and and I wish he was here, or I wish he was doing this over here. or I wish he chose a different path. It, again, I'm not using this as some sort of absolute or universal statement because there's always exceptions to the rule. But I think it is important to understand that if you do want a guy that leads, well, then there's there's going to be times where he will have to do stuff that is honor bound, duty bound, whatever it might be. Um, and And if you. If you're going to make him choose between those two things, understand that in his mind, he's not choosing between you and this other thing. Um, so you, you don't have, you, you don't have to compete with it in that sense. Well, and that's, that is one of the reasons why I think it's very important when you first meet people. Um, th- it's another reason why I think you cannot get physical. Yeah. I mean, just wait, wait on the physical stuff because you need to know their mind. You need to know if you are on the same page intellectually and you also have to know, look, he's going on this track with his life and that kind of attracts me to him, right? But you need to do some introspection and go, am I up to this task? Am I going to be able to support him in the way I need to on that path? And if you know If you just know that you're like way too high maintenance for that and like you're way too needy, you're way too insecure or whatever, you've got some work to do before you can jump in there. And so I'm, I am telling, I am saying that, so some of this is I'm addressing sort of this issue of, um, women who they will find somebody that they think is that really good guy. And then. Um, not understand why it's not working out the way they wanted it to and um, and why it's like they're just not connecting right and like he still goes off and does whatever he's going to do. Um, I think part of it is because um, you have to recognize whether or not you're willing to get on the path with that person that they're on and whether or not it meshes. And if you get physical too fast and you let your heart get way too wound up in it way too fast, then it will be really hard to extricate yourself and you're going to have a tough marriage if you do get married in the future or it'll be a tough relationship. And so don't, it's like, it to me, half the battle is recognizing who is not for you early. Recognizing this person, he's good looking, he's a great guy, but he's not for me. And I'm not. Well, and I think the other part I want to say on this is that I don't want to put it all in pejoratives. Like if you don't have the strength or if you don't have what it takes or you're too needy, like there's, there's some cases where it just might be, that's not the life you want. And and that's fair, right? That doesn't necessarily make you a a weak person, right? Yeah, But some women Uh, recognize that they need communication a lot. They mm -hmm. need reassurance a lot. Well, if there are certain men in certain professions where you're not going to get that, it is not, it is not possible for him to give that to you. And so if you know you're the type that needs that, then you need to go elsewhere. Um, that's all I'm saying. Either, either that or, or, you know, well, and just, it. It, and again, it's like, be honest with one another, like identify right. this early on. It, and it's, and, and keep in mind too, like Tina, Tina obviously had to adapt to me being in the military and me deploying. And especially in the units that I eventually ended up in. But by the same token, I also, I also had to understand, I also had to adapt for what the things I needed to do to help facilitate that. So she's making sacrifices for the sort of man and the husband that she wants. I also need to make sacrifices for the, the wife and the woman I love. Oh, absolutely. And, and, absolutely. And this goes, I, I'm this not goes saying back that this, men don't also have that uh, need for introspection and, and what they're willing to adjust and all that. I'm just coming from the women's perspective because I so often see these women who are like, you know, if he doesn't treat me like the princess I am and treat me like a queen and do this for me and do that for me and basically jump and, you know, every time I say jump, you know, there are women that have this idea that he should deal with all of her quirks and all of her baggage and all of all of her, you know, crazy, but she shouldn't have to deal with anything in return. And my my thing I'm trying to say is that 
recognize yourself, know yourself. You, you will not know, know whether or not you're getting what you want until you know yourself a little bit better. And, and that takes recognizing, are you, are you kind of a hot mess? Like if you are, (laughs) you know, what work can you do to get better? You know, because I, I just think that you've got to prepare yourself for what you want. So it's that whole idea of, you know, how do you attract the man that you want? Well, you've got to do some work to do that. It's not all looks. And the reason I say that is because, um, here's what happens to people when she's beautiful and she puts on this persona and tries to act like she's, you know, going to be super chill, even though she knows in her heart, she's not all that chill. And she knows in her heart, she's a little bit of a hot mess, but she's going to like go ahead and put on like this act in order to make him think she's super chill. So she can kind of hook him in and she's going to be gorgeous and the whole deal. And this is the thing is you don't want to make somebody fall in love with something that isn't really you. It's you want, you want them to love who you really are. And so you've got to be yourself. You need to present to them your mind, who you really are and communicate who you really are. Now, if it's off putting to them that you're so open and direct, then that's a, that's a good indicator. He's not ready either. And so, okay. So let's real quick, real quick before we, cause we're about to, I want to, I want to transition into that. So like the first one, as far as like, what do you want? I mean, part of it, like, again, your, your old statement was, is like, sometimes honestly, women aren't exactly sure what they want. Again, with men, I think we're, we're stereotyped and like, Oh, men only want one thing. And no, that that's not true. That, I'm not saying that thing's not important to us. I'm just saying it's, no, it's not the only thing. So I I do think for women, obviously you've got to look at, you know, what, what you find attractive character is the most important thing. And and a lot of times the way character is going to manifest in a man is kind of what they see as their, is their mission in life with respect to not just their profession, but what they see as their role as a husband and a father. And, and to Tina's point, um, and this is especially true of women, especially when it gets physical, when it starts to get physical, the, the chemical reactions that take place during that act mm-hmm. a, a, affect men and women in similar ways, but also in ways that are different. And and women will feel a, 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 a sense of attachment um, a, as a result of that chemically. And and so it's, it's one of the reasons why you'll hear in a lot of these podcasts, they talk about like pair bonding and stuff like that. And when a, when a woman's have multiple partners, it makes the pair bonding very, very difficult. I would argue it has that effect for both men and women, but it, it tends to manifest itself more chemically in women. And so the reason why you put the physical off is because those important, those important questions about what do you want him to believe? How do you want him to think and problem solve? How do you want him to address things? How do you want him to communicate? Those are all things that become a lot easier to figure out and discuss and talk about before the physical enters into the the component. Now, one of the things that, again, Kat mentioned is, okay, that's great. Um, I appreciate that. But I end up finding men who I think want the same things I do and who say they want the same things I do, but then it becomes apparent very, very quickly in the relationship that they want to go to the, they want to go to the physical stuff as soon as possible. And this is the part where I want to transition into part two, right? Is how do you find that, that guy, like, how do you, um, what do you do to attract the sort of person that you actually want? And from a, Again, from a man's perspective, again, if I'm just saying, what are the things that attracted me to Tina that indicated to me, not that just that, oh, this is a pretty girl, but indicated to me that this is someone that I, that's it. That's, that's the one and only for the rest of my life. Cause we got married. I was 19 when we got married. And again, for anybody that's wondering, oh, you, you two must have grown up in very, very traditional households where it, nope. No, we didn't. No, both of our parents divorced, remarried, mine got divorced again. Like, you know, it's so no, we, we saw a lot of divorce. There was a lot of, you know, you know, spending time at different houses. And for me traveling to, to see dad during the summers and mom and schoolers. So no, we didn't have this like effectively, you know, modeled for us in, in the most perfect, you know, way. Um, that's not to, you know, trash or belittle our parents at all. Like we all, I mean, Tina, I both love like our, our parents and I love my in-laws and the whole well, day. They, they, are they great also people. recognize it wasn't ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason why I, I point that out is that the things that I was attracted to Tina and the things that made me attracted to her far beyond this idea of, oh, that's just someone, you know, I want to get physical with, um, uh, was the, you know, again, for me, it was kind of the, she demonstrated an ability, um, almost from the first time we met 
where the first time we talked, we were talking about kind of weighty issues and we were arguing, right? It was not a gentle conversation. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I, I like the fact that she knew her own mind and she wanted to have a conversation. The other thing that I will say that I respected about Tina right off the bat, and and I will say I think this is I think this is catnip for a dude. Right? I'm just gonna say this and and Christian, you know, Hamilton, you know, back me up on this if you want. Boobs. No. It wasn't just it wasn't boobs. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Man, that really derailed this conversation. <laughs> Just kidding. Guys. No, it was the fact that we would argue, mm -hmm. but she didn't expect to win the argument because she was more, you know, passionate. She didn't expect to win the argument because, you know, she was a girl or she didn't expect to win the argument because she, you know, whatever. There wasn't a sense of entitlement in the way she argued. She expected to win because she thought she had a good argument, but she also recognized that there was actually standards for a discussion. And I, I can remember early on when someone, like if I made a good point, she would say, oh yeah, that's okay. That's a good point. And honestly, for, for a guy who we, we are, we are desperate to want to, to be able to connect with and, and have a relationship with a woman that we can love and that we can provide for and we can protect, right? If you're that traditional guy for, for a woman to be able to passionately argue with you, um, to use good reasoning, good argumentation, um, not without devoid of emotion, well, not, not, de emotional. not devoid of, not devoid of emotion, but not dependent upon not it. Not driven by emotion. Yes. Yeah. And, and then to say, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. I was wrong. Or, or when I was like, oh my gosh, like this is, we, we can problem solve together. We can figure stuff out together. Yeah. And, and, and for a guy that's not just refreshing, it's exciting and that's why because, it's so important to be yourself and to be able to present yeah. that side of yourself right away. I feel like if you meet somebody and you're going to meet up for a date or something like that, you should be tackling some questions right then. This idea that you're going to uh, meet them and kind of get to know them a little bit, but you don't want to scare them away with all these tough questions. No, get it done. Don't waste yeah. each other's time. Like That honestly, was my fault. That, that was <laughs> no go ahead multiple times now that's been my fault i've i've just been too afraid to ask like deep questions and so yeah. i'm constantly asking these like superficial questions that ultimately i don't care about and i know they don't <laughs> care about and it just doesn't go anywhere and um and i'm sure that for for women that there's there's a similar fear maybe maybe manifested in a different way but like i there's something to be said about everybody being afraid and, and I'm a complete total hypocrite for even bringing this up um, because I am f absolutely guilty of it at every single level. But there's something to be said about like being afraid um, to, I don't know, go beyond just, just the, the pure superficial discussion about, you know, the weather or something like that with somebody that you're interested in and asking some of those deep questions for exactly the same reasons that you brought up that like you're, you're afraid that you're going to scare them away. I mean, one thing that you were bringing this up at the very beginning of this episode, Tina, that like a lot of women don't actually know what they want. And it's like, they, they want the man to kind of guess what they want, even though they don't really know what they want. You know what it is? It's like you're on YouTube and you don't know what you want, but the YouTube algorithm is supposed to tell you what you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have to say some like gentle advice that I could give to somebody like Kat. And I, I don't know Kat very well. I know that, that she sent this, request in our circle group that led to this episode. But if, if I could give any advice speaking as, as a man, obviously I can't speak from a woman's perspective, but like if I could give any advice, I think something that, that guys want is for a woman to, to decide like what she wants to do with her life. Just like I think how women want that from men. And I mean that in a different sense. I mean like not what's your career goals, because one thing that, that I think women do know, but maybe not enough women know is that guys don't care about what your career goal is. It's it, it, they don't, it's, it's we not don't mean that, that mean, we don't, that yeah, mean it's just we not a deciding factor. A mean for way. Us. We, we don't mean that like, we're not going to support you in executing those career goals. Like if I find a wife and she has a career goal to do X, I'm going to do everything I possibly it's can. It's just not to help a factor her. for you. Yes. But it's not going to be a factor in me determining who I want to spend the rest of my life with. For women, I do think that they do look at, at what's a career goal with a guy. If, if a guy's career goal is to sit on the couch all day long watching anime and playing video games, 
that's not a very productive yeah. career goal. And I say this <laughs> as somebody who loves sitting on a couch and playing video games, but, um, but I also do some very productive stuff <laughs> outside of that. <laughs> Ladies. And so like, like, like for, for women, the, the advice that I could give is like, figure out what you want. What do you want? And I don't, again, I don't mean that in a career sense. I mean, like, what do you want in terms of family? How many kids do you want? That's a huge question. I have family and friends of mine who divorces happened and long-term relationships blew up because they disagreed on fundamental things like, again, what type of relationship or marriage is this going to be? How many kids are you going to have? Whether or not you're going to order the chicken or steak from Good Ranchers. Um, that's <laughs> <laughs> that was my key. I was well, trying to tee up the the ad. There, yeah, but. yeah, and that's and that that does remind me that if you if if one thing that we can all agree that we all want is quality food from Good Ranchers. Like we can all agree. I don't care where you are. I don't care what your life goals are there. Chances are whether you want to be a doctor or an astronaut or an influencer or whatever else it is, you're probably going to need some good steak, right? And so Good Ranchers is the place to go in order to get it. Like that's just the bottom line. For all the questions that we're going to try to discuss today that are complex and difficult and nuanced, this isn't one of them. You go to GoodRanchers.com. You put in promo code Nick. You sign up for one of the subscriptions. All of a sudden, steak, pork, poultry, and wild-caught seafood shows up to your door. And just to say thank you for subscribing with them, they're going to give you like a year's worth of free chicken, right? So like every order that comes in with that subscription, they're going to give you free chicken as a way of saying, hey, thanks for choosing us. It's it's one of the ways that they pour back into the relationship, if you will, with Good Ranchers. So go to GoodRanchers.com, use promo code Nick, because for the month of January, you sign up for that subscription. Not only are you going to get free shipping, not only are you going to get some money off, you're going to get that free chicken with the order. And again, it is a great deal. Good Ranchers likes to bin spell it. Good Ranchers like to say, we've had a lot of people that, you know, they, they first sign up for the steak and they love the steak, but then they realize how much they actually love the chicken as well. And so he's giving you an opportunity to basically call them out and decide whether or not that's a true statement. So goodranchers.com, use promo code Nick, sign up for a subscription, get a bunch of free stuff to go along with it. I promise you, you're not going to be disappointed with the quality of some of the best beef, pork, poultry, and wild-caught seafood that you can get. Okay. What do you got Great there, Great segue, Hamilton? Christian. Well, I know what I'm cooking for dinner tonight. I've got the beef <laughs> top sirloin steak. Also got my free two pounds of chicken with this order, too. So I'm pretty excited to open that, cook that up tonight. I did want to say, though. Yeah, Hamilton, that, uh, you need to bring that up here. Next time that you're in the studio, you need to bring the chicken up here so that way I can cook you buffalo chicken mac. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, consider I, I'll consider it. I'll consider it. So what was the I question? Wanted to say this. I wanted to say this. A couple months ago, um, Patrick Bet David posted a reel about how his first date with his wife, and he brought this book of like 90 questions that they went through, and they talked about each one. And I, there are really two things that, well, three things that help me understand whether or not a woman that I meet could be my potential wife. One is how, how active she is with her faith. Two is her opinions on sex before marriage and what her you know comfort with all of that is. And then three, how uncomfortable she is to have the, like, have the hard questions asked up front. And yeah. It doesn't matter who I talk to my age that is not involved in, in the making the argument type of crowd. They're always like, oh, you got to hold those questions for two, three, four dates in. You got to see if you're comfortable talking to each other. And at the end of the day, I don't want to go on two, three, four, five, six, ten <laughs> dates with you. If I don't know whether or not this has the possibility of working out. And so for yeah. any single woman listening to this podcast, if you get uncomfortable by those hard questions being asked early, that's a problem. Because I promise you, if I went on a date with you, there would be some type of deep, uncomfortable conversation, hopefully not uncomfortable, but deep conversation <laughs> happening on that, you know, just to really get to the meat of the situation, the meat of the situation. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, so well, I, I, I don't think we should be uncomfortable to have those conversations. Like, those are good things. Like, we have very important things to do in life. Like, build a family. Build careers together. Like, this is an opportunity to do something really great. I think yeah, typically well, women... Tina and I, women Tina and I figured... 
Wait a I've, second. T- okay. Tina and I knew each other actually for quite a while, and we'd had conversations about things before we had ever started dating. And where can I get? That's going to kind of go into that third category that we're going to talk about here, and that's where do you find these people? But when it comes to how how do you attract? the sort of person that you're looking for. Again, I, I think part of that is the idea of, okay, you know, again, what do you want? Part of, you got to figure that out. Another thing is how do you attract that? Um, look, there's, 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 you know, we talk about this all the time. We do like our 90 day challenge where we talk about, okay, like for the next 90 days, what are we all going to work on within our community? That's going to allow ourselves to improve ourselves like spiritually, emotionally, physically, professionally, intellectually. Right, because if, if you look at everything that you're looking for in another person, that you're you're looking with respect to what you're going to build as a family, um, those pretty much everything falls into one of those categories, right? The, the spiritual is important because it's what do you believe? Like, what what is the foundation of your worldview? And and a lot of people, even a lot of people that love the show, kind of like poo poo that as like, well, you don't really need that. Like, okay. If you if you want to believe that you can, I don't. I believe it is important. I believe it is it is absolutely critical to understand what the other person believes about objective truth, objective morality. You know, why are we all here? What is the purpose of existence? Right, and and faith provides insight into kind of the the, the rules for how someone navigates those very very important ultimately existential questions. And so don't negate that. Right. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of people, when we talk about what are the, where are the places you find people, you know, again, a lot of times people find each other in church, right? Not always, sometimes it always work out, but that is a common place because there's a shared set of values. And that's really, really important to understand. So when you're, you're asking yourself like, okay, what do I do uh, to attract the sort of person that I want you're probably, you know, answering some of those fundamental questions for yourself. What do you believe and why? Um, the other thing on on that emotional side is about understanding kind of who, like who you are. And, you know, Tina mentioned this before. Some people, they need a lot of connection. They need a lot of interaction. Other people, they, they want it to have a great deal of value and maybe even intensity. But they also understand that, you know, by virtue of me having to deploy and me having to go places, we couldn't always be with each other all the time, even though we wanted to be. And, and it's about understanding what, what are your emotional needs and how can, you, how can you also develop emotional maturity, right? Which is something, again, as a 19-year-old you know, private in the 82nd Airborne Division, I had some emotional maturing to do, right? Because you, you go from like, oh, I'm a you know, badass, whatever, to, okay, I, I, need to be, you know, I need to be available for my wife. I need to be sensitive, you know, all these. So there's emotional maturity that there's things that you can work on in order to develop that. And, and so much of it for on, on the men, on the men's side is about, you know, listening and understanding that a lot of times men and women approach problems differently. And so how do I develop the capacity to listen with the intent of understanding my, my buddy, Nate, that's one of his favorite things. How do you listen with the intent of understanding rather than just the intent of responding? And that's a, that's a huge source of you know emotional maturity and growth for for a guy when it comes to the intellectual do you have anything to say of value right like is it is is your entire knowledge of anything just pop culture i I will tell you this um again one of the things that attracted me to tina and it was because she wanted to talk about important issues um not just you know you know political spiritual you know things that were going on um things that were relevant to the sort of future that we were going to build together for it wasn't an uncomfortable conversation for Tina and I to talk about what our expectations were with respect to how should a husband behave, how should a father behave, how should a wife behave, how should a mother behave, right? Um, and chances and I don't are, mean behave, I, mean, I, I, was I don't say, mean behave in the subservient sense. I just mean that when, when it got to the when when it became very evident to us that we were serious about one another, having those discussions was fun. It wasn't uncomfortable. And and we did go into a great deal of of depth. So I, I appreciated her, you know, the the efforts that she had taken to develop herself intellectually as well. And then when it came to professional, I remember we talked about it. She talked about these are the things that I'm interested in, these are the things that I like, but by the same token, I want to be I want to be a mother, I want to be there for my children, and I want to marry a man that wants me to be able to do those things. So that that is a here's the part that needs to be understood. That is a professional goal. That's not, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be professional because I'm going to do this. No, actually treating, raising children, and managing a home is a professional aspiration, not just, you know, not, not just emotional one or not just like, you know, you know family. It, it is 
professional in the sense when you look at it is, no, this is, these are tasks that I'm going to perform that I am going to take pride in. Yeah. And women are, right. are made to feel kind of ashamed of that desire now. And yeah. there's a lot of women where it's, it's almost like their, um, their wiring has been mixed up. Um, you know, there's certain women that'll say, well, I'm just not the nurturing type, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I would say that's probably a lot more due to the influences of society and um, society basically telling you it's not okay to want to do these other things and that everything's about you and being super fulfilled in and of yourself before anything else. And, um, and the only thing that can really fulfill you is a high powered job, you know, some kind of career. Yeah. And, it's interesting because um, I remember wrestling with that in myself. Um, you know, I, I felt really, really sort of insecure for a long time about the fact that I chose to be a mom at home with my kids, homeschooling my kids. And when people would say, what do you do? I always kind of felt caught. Like, and, and then it just, I had this lady come up to me one time, um, I was running for office actually. And yeah. I had, I, I had dreaded some dreaded people asking me, you know, um, well, you know, what do you, what do you do for work? Or, you know, where did you go to school or whatever? And I dreaded that. And someone asked me and I said, well, I, um, married my husband out of pretty much right out of high school. And, um, my goal was to be a wife and a mother. And that is what I, that's what I wanted. And, um, and this woman was in the crowd and came up to me afterwards. And she said, you had this look like you might be a little bit embarrassed that that was your life choice. Um, and I wasn't embarrassed. It's just, I was so tired of, of people looking at me and, and acting like, I did something inferior, like what I chose was inferior. And this lady goes, let me tell you, I have three PhDs. She goes, you need to confidently explain why you chose the path you did. And it's okay that you chose the path you did. And you should never feel ashamed of that. And I, it felt good to have somebody that did all this stuff, um, you know, outside of being a wife and a mother, tell me that my path was legitimate. And so that is, it's, I think a lot of women really struggle with admitting that that's what they want because they have been told and told and told that, that that is not what you're supposed to want. You're supposed to want more than that. And a man won't want you unless you bring something to the table. And I actually do see men on, um, reels and shorts and, you know, various podcasts who are like, what does she bring to the table? Is she going to be able to help my finances? So there are men out there that, that aren't down with the whole, uh, traditional wife situation. Here's the deal. You need to recognize that you need to know it early. And that's one of the reasons why you need to be honest about what you want. Do you want to be a traditional wife or do you have a career path that you do love to do and are is it going to be something that you know I want to work having a family around this career path too and and have both you know um what it is is you need to know right out the gate whether this person is right for you or not and that is the very first thing and and usually I see men being more uncomfortable with those direct questions right away um men tend to be more uncomfortable with that than women. Women are like, let's get down to brass tacks here. I want to know what you <laughs> think about this, what you think about that. And, you know, I, I just, I think that uh, knowing what you really want is a hard thing for women. I think it's hard for men too, because men have also been told that it's not okay to want a wife that stays home. It's not okay to want a wife that takes care of the kids and have that be ma her main responsibility because men are told that, no, you putting a white a woman in that position is wrong and bad and you're, you know, toxically masculine, whatever, toxic masculinity. Men are told to not even ask women out anymore. Right. Like, like they're, 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 ter I mean, they're utterly terrified to even talk to women increasingly because yeah. of things like Me Too and, and, and modern third, increasingly fourth wave feminism. Yeah. And so, 
but to to gently push back to something that you said just a minute ago, Tina, when you were like, you know, there's there's some shows out there that, you know, the men are like, well, what do you bring to the table? It's not, again, it's not in a career sense that that question is being asked. That question is being asked in the context of the women across the table on these shows are saying things like, I demand a guy that, you know, is is jacked, six foot tall, makes six <laughs> figures. Yeah. and. And then the guy says, okay, great. So what are you bringing to the relationship? And it doesn't have to be a career. No, the, 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 I, I am specifically talking about money. Uh, I have seen guys see, say I, you need I, to bring money but, to the but table. But as, as a guy, when I see that that question, especially yeah. at who that's directed to, that question is more, if you're making these impossible demands, I mean, there's even things like the female delusion calculator, right? Which is like how many guys under the age of 30 or 35 you know, yeah. meet all of these different requirements. And then they'll ask the women on these shows and they'll be like, oh, I don't know, you know, 10, 20%. And then it'll be like 0.02% yeah. of the population. And, and so like this pushback that you're seeing is I think in part because of these like really delusional standards, but it's also because I, I, I think that again, there's a lot of, of men that have been kind of like indoctrinated so to speak into similar to what you said not not asking for these things or not looking for these things or feeling bad for looking for these things and so now you're seeing this pushback where men are getting a little bit more aggressive and saying okay if you're going to demand all this stuff from me then i'm going to demand all of these things from you and yeah well Ultimately, let's face these it when, people just when we, aren't when we look at around each other they're not they aren't good for yeah. each other they should just cross each other off the list and move on well and, that, and that's again so when you look at the first thing that we talked about is what do you want well mm -hmm. clearly if that's what you want and it doesn't make sense well then don't then move on yeah right and when we look at when we look at like you know some of these podcasts and whatnot um i mean th there, there's actually some interesting conversations going on and a lot of it is about pointing out the kind of like the the double standards of the delusions associated with with these expectations but again what what cat the person that asked us to talk about this was saying yeah but i'm not that woman yeah. <laughs> you know, i'm, I'm yeah. not i'm not any of those girls and, I, and i'm tired of being compared to them i'm tired of 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 being treated as if well that's all there is so why even bother she goes when i'm out here like desperately looking and then i will find someone that theoretically you know, says the right things about what they want and tradition and values and stuff like that. And then almost ultimately demonstrates that that's not what they want. And that's where I want to lead into this third point. All right. But I need to, I need to complete something with the other, because we talked about those five things, right? There's the spiritual, the emotional, the intellectual, the professional, and the physical. And the question is, is that how do you attract the sort of, per once you've decided what you want, or once you got a pretty good idea of what you want, how do you attract that? And that last category was the physical. And what I'll say on that is that Again, another thing that comes out of these shows um, where that gets men very frustrated is, okay, well, so apparently all the women in the world want two per, you know, 0.02% of the men. And it's been demonstrated over and over again that in a lot of situations, especially as society has become more promiscuous, that you know, 80% of the women are sleeping with 20% of the men. And then when they figure out that that man's never going to marry him, then all of a sudden they start looking to their, you know, second, third, and fourth tier. And those guys are like, screw you. I'm, I'm like, I'm not your left. I'm not, you know. And I'm not doing this. I'm not your backup guy. And so the question is, on, on, and, and because men have become so frustrated with what they feel are unrealistic expectations for how men are supposed to look, the other thing I think men need to realize is that women are not, women obviously have dealt with what they believe to be, and, and I think reasonably so, a lot of unrealistic expectations for how women are supposed to look. And this is something that I want to tell men out there when it comes to the physical. I think it's perfectly appropriate to obviously, you know, have things that you're attracted to as a man. It's perfectly appropriate for women to have things that are attracted to as a woman. And, and there are always things that we, there's, there's some things that we're born with that just are what they are. Um, and I'm not someone that believes that people should go out there and start injecting themselves with a bunch of stuff to try to drastically alter the way they look and things like that. I'm not judging people that, you know, whatever, make your own decisions. But but it is a, it is a good sign, right? It is a good sign when people try to stay at least like in in good physical condition. That's something that you can affect. It doesn't matter, you know, what a, what a, what other hand life has dealt you with respect to height or hair color or eye color or whatever else. You know, go, going working out, you know, stuff like that. That's always a, a good thing that you can develop that will make you feel better. That is good for your health. Um, and and again, I I you know I think people should maintain reasonable expectations with respect to that. But that is something that you can affect. Now, I want, to, I want to put this out for men for a second. Because, you know, 
advertising in general, but specifically porn, um, there's a lot of women out there that are, they, they want to be the traditional woman. They're, they're, you know, they are, they are, look, they do the right things. They, they, you know, stay in good physical shape. They eat right. The whole deal, right? Like all of those reasonable, healthy things, not, not ridiculous standards, reasonable, healthy things. And they feel like they've got to compete with whatever the airbrushed Instagram version is of, of the woman showing up on these podcasts, or they've got to compete with, with whatever, like, you know, very, very inappropriate and ultimately perverse fantasies have been created through pornography. And so the, the thing that I would tell both men and women on the physical side, because porn also affects women, it's not just something that, that affects men. First of all, stay away from that. Cut that out of, of your life because it is nothing but, it is nothing but toxic. I, I will, there's, there's even some people that I see that they give some advice on relationships every once in a while that I, a lot of good advice, but I, whenever the moment they say, well, you know, porn can actually be beneficial. Nope. The moment I hear those words, I'm like, nope. There, there's something fundamentally wrong with the way that they're analyzing and understanding the situation. If there's one thing I can tell both sides, it is at all times bad for both of you, period, the end. There, yeah. there, is, no, there is no beneficial component to it um, because it will ultimately, um, it, it, will, it will adversely affect the way that people see each other. It is fake. It is not real. And ultimately what you want in your relationship is something real. And, and I don't just mean that for the character component, the intellectual component, the, the emotional, the spiritual. You want the real on the physical side is too. And if you really want to be able to have someone that you are physically attracted to and you want to work to be physically attracted to them it, with the way that you present yourself, right? With, again, like basic, like for guys, right? You know, be clean, right? Be clean, dude, right? Um, you know, and, and show up and, and, and demonstrate to her that your appearance um, for her is important to you. Right, you want her. You want her to be proud in the way that you carry yourself and things like that. And women, same thing for guys. Right, all of that's good. But if you really want that to be, if you really want that part to be everything it can be as well, you have to cut out these these other influences that are invade constantly invading the visual, the mental, and everything else. And and not creating. I, I hate it when we use that term like lower your expectations or manage your expectations. No, no, no. It's not about lowering your expectations. I didn't lower my expectations for my wife. I kept them incredibly high, but I also tried to keep them in line with the things that matter, that truly matter for a, a marriage and a relationship that is is not just strong in all those other categories, but also passionate. Right? And if you want to have that, then there are things that you have to do and that you have to prepare yourself for and that you have to like guard against in order to genuinely have that. So I wanted to end that point on the physical and I want to move into this next category because I think there, there's we got we got three more categories to go, right? Where do you find them? Red flags and deal breakers. And does this really work in today's environment? So that this next one, where do you find them? I think this is one of the most important. And Christian said something earlier that I, I do want women to understand because this is something that I've, as I've listened um, to people talk about dating today that has become very, very prevalent. And that's this idea that guys aren't sure what they're supposed to say or what they're supposed to do or when they're supposed to approach or anything like that. Not simply because they will get rejected, but because it could be career ending. Right. And, and I'm not talking, you know, obviously men should be appropriate in the workplace and appropriate in public spaces and things of that nature. But if you look at the areas where a lot of people tend to met the person they were going to marry, college, uh, workplace, okay, well, now the workplace, that is an incredibly dangerous thing. You could be doing something that you find that you think is perfectly innocent, like, you know, hey, would you like to go out and get a drink sometime? Well, now all of a sudden you've created a hostile work environment, even though if Doug would have done it, it would have been perfectly fine because she likes Doug. The bottom line is the moment a guy feels that that is, a, that is an unsafe environment to do that, they're not going to. And if they're, if they're not going to be able to actually, you know, potentially form a romantic relationship in an environment where there's already some sort of shared, um, you know, component or culture or interest, right, then you, you wipe out an entire category. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about bosses taking advantage of, of subordinates, whether that's men or women. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that understand something. Same thing with education. You go to a university now, and chances are, if, if it, you're a single woman in a university, the idea that you are probably going to fall on a side of the, the you know, political and ideological spectrum um, that is incredibly hostile toward men is very high. Like All the stats point to this. That's not to say every woman in college believes that, but again, when, when you're a guy operating in an environment where asking the wrong question or saying the wrong thing 
to the wrong woman could potentially get you in a ton of trouble, they're going to start to shut down. They're not going to be, they're not going to go out there and actually provide the sort of, you know, they're not going to ask you out even when you want them to, if the consequences for asking them out in that environment are potentially catastrophic. And so this is the part where it becomes very, very important for if you are the traditional man, the traditional woman looking for that traditional other, right? Where do you actually go to find these places? Because a lot of the places you used to be able to go to are no longer safe. Christian Hamilton, as, as young guys in this environment, is that is that a fair assessment for how you look at that with respect to like either college or the workplace? I, I think that that's a fair assessment. I think that a lot of the reason why I probably have not asked more girls out on dates is because I understand that the likelihood that I am going to align with this individual on faith, you know, things of that nature is relatively low. But the likelihood of those things aligning also increases based off of where I am at. As we've talked yep. about a couple of times now, the Homesteaders of America conference was great opportunity to meet a future wife. I was not successful this past year in October. Things may change. <laughs> Things may change for this coming October. Um, but what I can say is, is that my future wife might be able to find me in 2024 or I find her uh, in a church small group. That's one location. Uh, at the gym, it's another location. Uh, and just hanging around town with friends and different things like that at trivia nights and different things. One of my goals for actually for 2024 is to physically put myself in more locations where I could meet my future spouse. Mm -hmm. And because I don't like online dating, I don't like dating apps. You know, you talked about being fake, Nick. I, I can't help but feel like dating apps are a, you know, this, this persona that you would like to be seen as and people are you know, catering their profiles to meet the expectation that they have for themselves or the vision that they have for themselves. And I've always found that to be somewhat dishonest. Um, but that's a goal for me in 2024. So yeah, I think um, that those are my thoughts on that. Well, nobody's going to find me unless they break down my door and drag <laughs> me out of my house. Gosh. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You're, you're going to lose all complaining privileges here at some point, oh, Christian, fine. just I've, by virtue I've of just, that. I've got a lot going on in my life right now. Adding a relationship to it is like, like we've got some new projects coming up and this is a big year. But Christian, Christian, do you have, when it really comes down to it, do you actually have anything going on in life if you aren't doing it with your future spouse? Like I'm to the point in my life where I don't feel I've got one of the best careers I could have ever asked for. I'm working with some of the best people I could have ever asked for, making good money. But I don't feel like I have jack squat until I am doing in service to my future spouse, my future family, and what we will build together. Like I haven't told everybody publicly on the podcast yet. And you know, I was waiting for more of an official time, but I've made a location change here recently from Virginia to North Carolina because I am so focused on building my family and finding the one that I'm going to do it with. I just didn't feel like the possibility was very high in Virginia, and my I, I want to build my future family around my family where they are at. And but do you really have anything <laughs> going on if it isn't with? the woman you could spend the rest of your life with and the family that you could be building with her. I mean, that's, I, that's slightly outside the focus of the episode, but to give a short answer, yes, yes. Um, I, I, I don't know what to say. Like, I mean, it, it, I'm not actively searching for somebody. Um, and, you know, I, I previously was, and maybe I will again in the future, but I'm just, I'm not actively searching for somebody. I've, I've got... I've got a fantastic career as well that's finally actually taken off and and in there's more stuff coming. So I mean I'm I'm professionally I'm quite happy with where I'm at right now and I'm I mean I'm I'm ecstatic with where I know things are are going. But well it, it, I mean here it goes back to the whole like like what do you want? 
the, the, the best piece of advice that I could give somebody like Kat is figure out what you want. And I know that it might be difficult. Tina says that women don't really know what they want. Figure out what you want. That is my, my best piece of advice. Figure out what type of woman you want to become. Figure out what type of wife you want to be. If that, And presumably, she is looking for a husband, right? So figure out what type of wife you want to be. Figure out what your your plans are for your family. Figure out what that relationship looks like. And then you will be able to know once you have those things nailed down where you need to go in order to find the type of husband that is right for you. That That's the best advice that I can give. And, and don't force it either. If it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. There's 8 billion people in this world, 4 billion men. I, you don't have to settle. And I don't, I don't mean that in the, in the, modern feminist sense that you're seeing on places like whatever podcast where the women are again have these outrageous expectations and they're like well i don't want to settle i don't mean it in that sense what i mean it in in the sense is you don't have to 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 pick a guy that doesn't share your values and your vision and your worldview and your plans for your family and your career it, it, it just because you're panicking, and I know that the whole biological clock thing is different for men and women. A oh, man, yeah. it's a, a man can get married women. in his forties and have kids. Yeah, right. And and so I I understand that there's, you know, you're you're on the clock in a way that that for men it, <laughs> you just aren't. And and I also understand that there's a lot more commitment in some ways for a woman when it comes to relationship. I don't mean emotionally, I mean physically in the yeah. sense that a man can have, and it, ask Genghis Khan how many how many children he can have, right? Yeah. A, a woman can only have a, a fixed number of, of kids because it takes nine months to make one. And so I, you know, there's all these things that that's, that's called like the Bateman principle. It's the reason why women are literally a, women in, a limiting resource within a civilization. There's other limiting resources like the amount of food you can grow. Well, the reproductive <laughs> capacity of your population is also a limiting resource. And, and this is also why in almost all societies and also all species, almost universally, the male courts the female because mm -hmm. the female is the limiting resource. Now, the problem from the female's perspective is, well, the guy's supposed to come to you, but if if you haven't found one that, again, shares those visions and and has that same you know life plan that you have, well, then what are you just supposed to sit around and wait for the for Prince Charming yeah. to come along as, as well, you let well, the years I, pass by? I understand the fear. I understand the fear, but you're not going to fix that problem until you sort out, you answer those questions. You have got to answer those questions first. Well, but here, here's the deal. Like, I, I think, again, reading through what you, I think she really has in many respects. And and Christian, I, I've got a, if, if for some reason this doesn't all work out, you really should write romantic Hallmark cards, like for women, like, you're the sexiest limiting resource. That <laughs> <laughs> That's just how I speak. If you let, no, like, no, I get it. I get the, it. I get it. Day, I get it. The other day I was, <laughs> this was like yesterday. It was over the, it, it, uh, yesterday, the day before the other day I was looking at like the podcast numbers, right? Cause I, yeah. I'm, I just spaz out about that type of stuff. I'm a geek when it yeah. comes to, to stuff like that. And I was looking at this number and I see like the number of audio downloads that we get, not counting YouTube or anything like that. And I'm like, Whoa, that's a large number. And then it dawned on me and I'm like, holy cow, that means that many people are listening to me every single episode. <laughs> and then that, that like instilled a sense of like existential fear in myself because I'm like, it's intimidating. Oh my God, it's intimidating because I, I, and I've told people this before when Nick and I are, are talking on the podcast, I usually just treat it like Nick and I are just talking. Yeah. yeah. And and then I have to remember, oh no, there's like tens of thousands of people <laughs> that are, it's not just a conversation between Nick and I or Tina and I or, or the three of us or the four of us with Hamilton. No, no, no. There's, we're in a room and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people listening. So I understand that some of the stuff that I said about like limiting resources and stuff like that <laughs> might either be awkward or maybe even <laughs> offensive, but I don't mean it in an offensive way. Yeah. I understand that it's awkward, but it's just the way that I process information. Well, let me, yeah, no, that's fair. Can, I'm can just I chime in here? Time. I have just, well, I have there, go ahead, go Hamilton. I, I have a quick question. Christian, I'm sorry. I was not trying to be a butthole. It was not my intention. <laughs> Uh, but, <laughs> he doesn't even have to try, Christian. <laughs> um, okay, we need I have to edit question. that. <laughs> I have a question, though, Tina. Uh, so we're t we we are we are having this conversation about figure out what you want, and I think Christian was right when he said that. But I think there are a lot of people who are in the situation of 
the only thing that they want is to not be alone. Yeah. And and they don't know beyond that. And well, you don't and know so you what cannot, you don't know, right? <laughs> right. You don't know what you don't know. And and I think it's good for us to understand that it may require some research to figure about figure out what we want. But Tina, what would your recommendation for someone who is in that situation? What should their next steps be to trying to identify what it is that they do want beyond not wanting to just be alone? Well, I mean, not wanting to just be alone is a, is a pretty good um, motivator, of course. Um, but at that point, that's when you need to go, okay, well, why don't I want to be alone? What is it that I'm looking for? And it's not just about not being alone because you could not be alone with friends. You could have a roommate. You could. It, there's a lot of different not being alone scenarios. You could go <clears throat> move in with your parents and not be alone, right? What you really want, though, I think is a deep and meaningful connection with somebody who is yours and you're mm-hmm. theirs. And the, that idea that you are going to have something meaningful for the long term um, and you're going to, from this point on, build a life together. So it's not just, I don't want to be alone. It's the idea of, are you ready to build a life together. It's not, I'm going here, he's going here, does this line up? It's what am I willing to do to make adjustments to build this life together? And um, I think that's really what I think that deep desire is, is to have someone who like loves, like really truly loves you and is excited to see you when you come home. And, you know, is there to, um, you know, kind of pour out affection and love on you when you're having a bad day. You know, somebody that you get to look forward to when something, when things aren't great and you got somebody to hold on to though, and you can do it together. And I, I think there's a lot of reasons not to want to be alone, but there's a, the, the point is why does it have to be a romantic relationship? Why do you want the husband wife relationship? And I think it's because we are meant this is, we are, we really are meant to pair up and build something together and build families together and a legacy together. And, um, and it's a deep and meaningful process and people really don't put very much thought into it nowadays. They put a lot more thought and energy into the wedding day than they do into the, into the rest of the marriage. And, you know, if people spent half the time thinking about how they're going to be an amazing spouse rather than how they're going to plan an amazing wedding, uh, I think we'd have a much lower divorce rate. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, all that to say, you know, it's fine to, if, if you're comfortable being alone, that's fine. You, I'm not saying that you have to go out and find somebody, you know, but while you're waiting, it's a good idea to look at yourself and go, am I all of the things I want. So I want this in a man. Am I that? Am I that? So if I want somebody um, who is caring and understanding and and listens and engages in conversation, well, do I do that for others? Have I done the practice to ask questions of others and actually really try to dig into their mind? Because I want someone to dig into my mind, right? So it's this idea of start putting into practice in all of your relationships the good, healthy things that you want to come out of your ultimate marriage relationship, you know, and, and that kind of, I mean, we all, I was telling a friend of mine, you know, it's, it's like we all have our toolbox packed for us by our parents. And sometimes our parents didn't give us the right tools for the right situation, Um, and it's up to us then to try to figure out what the right tool is, learn how to use it and add it to our toolbox. Right. And that could be communication. That could be in, um, how we interact with other, other people, how we work, how we live our lives and how we keep our home. So there are all these different areas where we could really, while we're waiting, we could be doing better. We could be getting ourselves ready and building new habits and building new, you know, new ways of doing things that maybe weren't taught to us by our parents, but that we are going to implement moving forward so that we can be better and be better prepared um, as parents and as spouses. And, and even just as sons and daughters, you can make all of your relationships better by doing that. And so um, 
that's that's the idea to me is the the how to attract wh- who you, who you want you got to you got to be you know you got to be what they want also and then um i would say also this idea of where you find them um alex uh, the real Alex. Oh gosh, what's her last name? I can't remember. The Cooper. Clark. No, no, no. Clark. Clark. Real yeah, yeah. Clark, yeah. She was talking about how you know men always say they don't want women that dress all skanky and all this stuff, right? But she, and then she shows this outfit of what she wore to a club with her friends, and it was like super conservative, you know, high neck, long pants, you know, not. Close. But it was classy. It, I mean, was it was classy, not super yeah. close fitting. And she goes, and you know what? People made fun of me for that. Here's the deal, you guys. And, and she she had a good point, but I've got a counterpoint, okay? You went into an environment where it's expected, where everyone dresses like a stripper, and you did not do that. You got made fun of. Well, those aren't the men you want anyway. Those are not the men you want. That's not the correct pool to find yeah. who you want. So if you're going to the club and... The alcohol is flowing and everybody's grinding up on each other, dancing on the dance floor. Really? You think you're going to find the one there? Really? No, I don't care how conservative you you dress and do all of this. You're still not going to attract the right guy there, no matter what. And so you've got to put yourself into the pools. So there's a lot of fish in the sea, right? But there's also a lot of pools that bring them down into smaller portions. You need to go to the pool that is most likely to have people of like-mindedness there. And, what? you know, if you that, don't... That's the, part, that's the part I want to emphasize before we go into this next category of, like, red flags and, and deal breakers, right? Because there's a difference between red flags and deal breakers. Um, but, yeah, when, when we talk about where do you go to find... This is the part that I, I, I kind of started this off with, is that some of the traditional places that you used to go, school and work, to find or, or that you would naturally find somebody because if you were in school together, you were in natural proximity and you were discussing things like ideas or whatever it was. And then if you were in work, there was at least something that was was a, a common thing between you know the two of you. And so these were common places that people met. And, and, and they're largely off limits in many respects now uh, because of the way that the culture treats them. The thing that I want to emphasize is that, um, and, and I, and I hear this, I hear this a lot from people and it's kind of sad when they're like, well, you know, I used to think that I would, I meet my spouse at church, but you know, it's just as bad there as it ever. Okay. But <laughs> I, here's what I will say. I don't want to pretend that it's the exact same environment that when Tina and I met each other and, and ended up getting married. But I, I do want to say that the principle remains the same. It may be more difficult to execute the principle. It may be that the the areas that you would find someone are reduced or diminished or that there's other potential problems with them. I understand all of that, but the principle remains the same. Like it, the, the principle is effectively unchanging. And that is you know, before you look at maybe the physical or the other things that, that are going to attract you to someone, you have to first, first put yourself into those areas where you have a higher degree of probability of finding somebody with similar worldview and values right? Because you're going to find the other things that you like, but, but if that's the most important, like the most important is worldview and values. And I, and I would argue that is, that is the most important thing. Then you have to go to those areas where there's a high degree of probability that you will find people that share those values. And then you pick from that pool, right? That's, that's, that's your pool. That's your environment. It isn't 4 billion people. It isn't 8 billion people. It's that's your pool. Yeah. Well, and, these and guys want to know so, where so you to find, go, So you right? find, okay. I, yeah. So you find those areas. Now, again, for a lot of people, I'm still going to say church is still going to be a, a primary environment, place of worship, et cetera. Um, but again, you know, not all churches are the same, right? Like if, obviously if you're going to a church where the average age in the church is 65, chances are that's not a good deal for you, right? If you're going to a church that says they're a church, but then espouses a bunch of things which are like openly heretical, then that's not a good deal for you. So it is about finding that environment where the, the, the your values are genuinely shared, but it also provides you an opportunity to be able to find people that could potentially be someone you'd want to marry. Another area where you see that is, you know, Hamilton offered some things with, you know, going to the gym or whatnot. Now, again, a gym is, is you're, you're going to find maybe similar interests, but not necessarily similar values. And so what, what I would say is that, again, you're, you're make sure that you're, you're thinking about this logically and reasonably that if these are my most important criteria, then where do I go? Again, I think church is an important one. There's other things that are, are shared common interests. 
that also, you know, are, are more likely to produce. So even within a, within a church or maybe a religious style organization, it may be sports related. It may be hiking related. It may be something else, but like common interest associated with common values is very important. There, there's a reason why, you know, again, I, I have, I have said so much and, and people are probably, you know, maybe they're tired of me talking about it. The Homesteaders Conference is something that I, I loved, obviously not from the perspective of finding a spouse. I've already done that. But I found it rejuvenating because I was around people where there was common interest and common values. And it was a very, very encouraging atmosphere and environment. So again, <clears throat> you know, if 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 I was, you know, going back and, you know, I, I would imagine to meet someone like, like uh, you know, a Tina at an environment like that because of the shared values and shared interests. And so that's what I would encourage people to do. Look for look for the sort of like um, activities, events, clubs, organizations, whatever it is, where you're going to have a, a good, a high degree of probability of finding common values and common interests. Because what you're going to find out is that, yeah, you're not going to walk up to a woman that you just met and say, oh, you look kind of pretty. And I noticed you're at the Homesteaders Conference. Let me ask you about your concept of marriage. No, you're not going to do that. That's weird and awkward. Don't do that. But- if you're already in an environment, right, where you're starting to notice like, oh, we're all here. We're all focused on this particular thing. Oh, I've talked to, hey, this other person and I are talking. We share to have, we seem to have common interests, common values. Okay, now we're going to, you know, go on that first date or whatever it is. Or we're going to go on that first outing that is that is a little bit more, you know, intimate than the typical setting that we found ourselves in. And and a lot of some of those primary questions um, have, have, you know, been kind of um, answered just by virtue of where we're at. And now we get, now when we do ask those questions in order to confirm, it's not as awkward. It's, you know, it, it's something that we're both interested in. So that's what I want to get to. Um, again, find those, find those environments, common interests, common values. That's probably where you're going to find somebody yeah. that, that meets the rest of the criteria that you're looking for, for a potential spouse. And that takes me into that next point, which is red flags and, um, and deal breakers. And this is the part where I want to make something very, very clear. There's a lot of things that can potentially be red flags because none of us are perfect, right? And and the more you go through life, the more chances you've had to screw things up. And what I want to make very, very clear here, because sometimes I think people get maybe a little depressed when we talk about certain things that, hey, these are standards, these are things, these are ideals to to search for. And people are maybe thinking to themselves, well, I've already screwed up then, right? And and I, I want to make something very, very clear there's there's ample opportunities to screw up the longer you live and and I can certainly point to a long list of things that I've I've screwed up on that I didn't do well that I wish I could go back and change and that's one of the things you end up doing as a parent is helping your own kids navigate around the the potholes that you ran directly into so I I want to say I want people to understand that look you might find somebody that hey you've made mistakes and they've made mistakes the real question is where are you now and what did you learn from them have they been identified as mistakes or, or do people have this flippant idea, well, that was just me in my younger 20s, or that was just me in college. No, no, no. There's a big difference between someone that said, you know what, I, this happened in college, and yeah, I wish I hadn't done that, and, and this is what I've learned from it, and this is what I want now, and this is why I know what I want now. And you know, I, I wish I could take that back. I can't, but I did learn from it, and I don't make excuses for it. I learned from it. That is someone that, look... <laughs> That's someone that has learned from a, maybe a difficult decision or a difficult experience or whatever else it is. And so when we talk about red flags, obviously if somebody has you know made mistakes in their life, it could be anything. Maybe it was financial. Maybe it was personal and, and physical. Maybe it was professional. The, the real question that you need to ask yourself when they're doing it is what did they learn from it? Because if they have shared values with you and they have shared interests with you, but this is something that, hey, they're owning up to. And that you you have stuff that you may have to own up to. You know, again, having grace for one another um, is, is really important. And and so I, I want people to understand that when we talk about the ideals, it's not because I believe I'm certainly not a perfect representation of all the ideals. But that's the beautiful thing about ideals; they don't change when we screw up. And that what that is what makes them worth aspiring to, because even in the aspiration to them and the and the and the the striving for them. We are made better through that process. And so that's what I would say. Yes, if certain things come up, it may be a red flag, but that just might mean that there's questions to, to ask. That might just mean that there's a little bit more digging to do. Other red flags, um, and, and let, me, let me distinguish between these two. 
there's red flags where it's like, okay, there's some baggage here, but the person understands that it's baggage. The person understands that this wasn't ideal and they've learned from the move on. The other red flags are the sort of things where there's baggage and people don't associate it as baggage or there's personality traits or there's habits that's been developed or there's things that they're struggling with that you're going to need to ask yourself, is this something that can be overcome or is this something that moves into the category of deal breaker? And this is why I want to start right off with, again, you know, addressing this kind of back to, to Kat because one of her biggest things, and you can tell, like, it's very frustrating for her. It's like, I, you know, I want, to be, I want to be that traditional wife and I want a traditional husband. And I find a guy and I think we share the same values. And I think we share similar interests. And then it becomes very, very obvious that they want to move towards something physical in a way that I believe is inappropriate. I would tell you right now, I believe any guy that is pressuring you to move physically, that is not just a red flag. That's a deal breaker. Yeah. That is a deal breaker because if, if the guy is not willing to commit to you before opening it up though, that other side of the physical, I don't give, and I don't give a dang what society or culture says about it. They're wrong because that physical is so important to the relationship that you're going to have in the future, right? If they are pressuring, if a guy is pressuring a girl to get physical like that, um, before they're willing to marry you, not just get engaged, marry you, that's a deal breaker. And, and, I, and I know that that probably sounded, sounds extreme in, in this modern day and age, but back to you know, Tina's point earlier, Christian's point, you know, and several other points we've made, when it comes to actually building a life with someone, because that's, that's what marriage is. It's building a life together. It's not, you know, I have dreams and she has dreams and we'll see how it figures out. No, no, no. When we got married, we had dreams. And so I, I think that is, it is just so incredibly important. Somebody might have a past and that past might be something that you guys can set down and, and forgive and, and move on for and, and you know, whatnot. Um, but if someone is, is saying, yeah, that was my past and you're still seeing that they haven't really moved away from that. And they're now they're pressuring you to do those things. I think that's, I think that's a deal breaker and I'll, I'll open it up to, you know, what Tina thinks of that, but that's just my honest opinion. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to mention some things on, um, on red flags because I, I kind of want to do this in a way where it's, it's, you see uh, married relationships that went badly and ended. Right. And I kind of want to go backward from there and go, but did, were there red flags before those people ever got married? And I've never seen a situation where there were not red flags. There, there were situations where the person should have run and they didn't. And why is that? And so um, I think if we start getting ourselves used to, or people start getting themselves used to recognizing traits early that are going to be detrimental later on. Um, I mentioned to Nick when we were discussing this topic that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, women have this fear that, you know, I mean, you attract a man by, you know, being beautiful, right? And, and then beauty fades. And down the road, there are things that happen to your body that, that make it less attractive. There are things that can happen. You could have breast cancer and get a double mastectomy, you know, and, and, or, you know, whatever. You have to go through chemo and your hair falls out. You know, there's a lot of different ways that a beautiful woman could lose that outward beauty over time. And if the only thing he was really very attracted to in you was the looks, that's when you end up with the guy that maybe isn't going to be very constant when all of that happens. Like we've known uh, situations where, you know, these type of things have happened to the woman and the man has left. And um, no, this idea that we didn't, we couldn't really recognize that early on, uh, I beg to differ. I think you can know that a little bit early on. And the way I think you do that is when you first meet the person, first get to know the person, are they super focused on how pretty you are? <laughs> are they really focused on um, wanting to show you off to their friends or whatever? And they're so focused on, I don't know, the how attracted they are to you. Um, but and, and maybe that also can be identified with how quickly they want to get physical as well. But on the other side of it, 
when you're having conversations with the person, because to me, you've got to be intellectually connected. They've got to be in love with your mind. Um, and if you don't give them a chance to do that and you don't recognize that they really aren't that into your mind, then you're setting it up to later uh, have someone who may not be very constant, who may not be that good guy that stands by you that is committed and loyal. And um, if you are in conversations with the person and they don't seem all that interested in the deeper things that you're talking about, and they don't, they may let you talk, but they don't actually ask questions to probe deeper. Um, and, and when they talk about things, it's kind of maybe superficial, you know, you, and then the other thing also to get into is find out what their family life is like. If you, yeah. if it takes them a long time to bring you to meet their family, that's a red flag. Okay, and it's not real, to say, real quick, not real to quick, say that Tina. it wouldn't be, it's not to say that it, it couldn't be resolved, but it should put up some feelers like, hey, why isn't, why isn't he wanting me to meet the family? And, well, wait a second, Tina, yeah. Tina, can we, can we like bring this back a little bit? Because I actually think this is a really, really good point that I want to focus in on. I don't want it to be just kind of a part of a rolling conversation. Because, you know, the, this introduction to the family, people, we, we have this idea in modern society that introduction of the family is like, oh, oh, wow, it's serious now. Um, and it's like, well, wait a second. Why didn't that happen a whole lot earlier? And, and the reason why, there, there's multiple reasons why introduction of the family fairly early on in the relationship is pretty important. Now, people are going to come up with a thousand excuses for why it can't happen. My family's crazy or they live on the other side of the country or whatever it is. We're, we're not we're not talking necessarily about this idea where you're you're all sitting down at the dinner table together, although that is ideal. Um, but we are talking about discussion of one's family and being able to see the family dynamic one came from, not because you're going to write them off if it wasn't you know ideal, but because what that 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 family dynamic that that other person that you're going to build a family with, that family dynamic played into their expectations, their idea of what family looks like, their idea of what, and one of the reasons why we emphasize so much that the, the first thing your kids, the first thing your kids are learning about marriage is watching mom and dad and how they interact. And so understanding that family dynamic, not to write them off if it's not ideal, but to just understand the potential red flags that might present as a result is very important. Yeah, it definitely, um, it helps you identify where your challenges might lie. It doesn't mean it's something that it's not like we're not in a deal breaker mode. You just yet yeah. we're just, we, this area here deserves a little bit more, uh, examination. So if, if the family dynamics, not very good, uh, probing that and finding out what, like what's at the heart of this? Like, do these people have a hard time communicating? Do these people lock everything down and then have huge blowouts? You know, do they, um, do they treat each other well? Do they say things they don't mean? Do they, do they say hurtful things to one another and then wish they hadn't? You know, there's a lot of things like that that you can observe and, and you can find out how these things happened and, and how things went down. And that'll give you a really good idea as to how you're going to be treated. And, um, well, and, and in, go ahead. I think something to consider too, when you notice a problem in someone else's family, the question is, has this person that you're dating also noticed that this is a problem? And if yeah. they have noticed that yes. it is a problem, do they have their own plan to not repeat that problem? Yes. And if they have yes. a plan, if they have a plan to not repeat it, well, that that's, that's sounds like a green flag to me, you know? Yeah. Oh, Hamilton, that's an excellent point. Like, because again, keep in mind, I when when Tina and I started dating, my parents had been divorced remarried and then my mom had been divorced again and you know the whole deal right so there was there was stuff right her parents had been divorced and remarried and so when we sat down to talk about this one of the things that that we discussed is what what did we see as a result of like you know how that affected family how that and again please understand something I have a wonderful relationship with my mother. I have a wonderful relationship with my father. I love all my brothers and sisters and I love Tina's folks. Like I, I love Tina's in, in laws, like her, her biological dad and stepmom, her, her biological mom and, and stepdad. I, I again, I, I, 
love and respected all of them. So this none of this should be interpreted as, oh, we're just bashing on our parents. That's not it. But Tina and I both came from situations where because we knew that, that you know, and our parents would all admit this, not ideal situations. I wanted to know how she interpreted that. I, she wanted to know how I interpreted it. We both wanted to know why we thought various things happen and how would we avoid the, the, the pitfalls that our parents fell into. And so far from being a, a, like a, a concern ultimately about how our own marriage would turn out, we turned something that initially would have started off like this is a red flag. This is a concern. We discussed it. And what we found out was that our experience had had equipped us in part because our parents were honest about things that they did wrong and what they should have done differently. We were now equipped to identify problems and then to set up mitigating factors to make sure that these things didn't happen to us. Right. One of the questions that, um, that we asked each other right away. And, and I, first I will say, uh, I had a boyfriend before Nick and I had asked him the same question. Um, and the, I, I had asked this boyfriend, um, is marriage forever? Like if you get married, is it forever? Is divorce an option? And he goes, well, I think if it just doesn't work out and like people aren't happy, you shouldn't stay together. And that told me everything I needed to know because the minute, because marriage gets hard, you guys, relationships are hard. Friendships get hard. Mother, daughter relationships get hard. You know, every relationship you have has moments where you're a little mad at the person or things are a little rough at the moment, right? Every single relationship and your marriage relationship is no different. You are going to have moments where you are just so annoyed with another each other or frustrated with each other. You can't get on the same page or whatever. And if the minute it gets hard, you check out and divorce is on the table. Well, I mean, I'm glad I knew that young and, the, and, you know, broke up with the guy. <laughs> okay. I asked the same question of Nick. We both came from families of divorce. This guy that I had dated before his parents were still together. He had, he didn't, had never experienced what it was like to be a kid of divorce with Nick and I, we were both kids of divorce. And when I asked Nick is marriage forever, like when you get married, is it going to be forever? And is divorce an, op is divorce an option? He immediately said, no, it's not an option. It's forever. And I said, that's what I believe too. Like, I don't think there's any reason to get married if you think divorce is ever going to be an option. Uh, either one of you. And if, if one of you thinks, yeah, it's not an option, and the other one's like, well, and then they have to be brought around to the idea of it. Nope. Red flag right there. Uh, because they're not they're not on the same page with you. Even if you manage to get them to come around and say they're on the same page now, their initial response was not that. It's not in their heart. And so that is, that's kind of all that to say, you know, those are some of the things, questions you can ask. And they're hard questions. They're tough questions. Oh, I mean, there are really hard questions like um, that I would tell any girl to ask the young man that is taking her out. Uh, ask don't ask the question uh, to, don't lead the questions too much to where they give um, the answer they're pretty sure you want to hear. Yeah. So instead of don't saying- Don't let them game the questions. <laughs> yeah. In, instead of saying, you know, uh, you know, do you look at porn? Uh, say something like, how often do you look at porn? And that way- you're giving them an out to assume they might look at some. And maybe, I mean, they're still not going to want to answer you very honestly, probably, uh, if they do look at it. But if they don't look at it, you're going to know. They're going to be like, never. Like, they're going to be almost offended at the question, right? And so I, I think that it's really important to ask these questions pretty point blank because if it scares them off, it scares them off. Why would you want to waste your time? Why do you want to waste their time? Well, you know? let, let me, let me, let me say another thing when it comes to red flags, like not all of the questions are, are like, you know, again, not everything's an ambush question uh, on the most uncomfortable thing possible. Right. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's a, a, a way to do this that is both direct, but also like courteous. Um, but this is why I go, this is why I go into this idea that once you've identified what you want, once you've actually worked on yourself to be the sort of person that is going to attract the thing that you want, once you've gone to the areas in the, of, of those common values and interests, now, when you're working through, again, when you're working through this process, 
Tina and I had conversations about how many kids do you want to have? What do you think about bedtimes? What do you think about the role of the wife? What do you think? And we were honest about it because there was no point in not being honest about it. And, and I think that's something to where, again, part of this is, is putting yourself into the sort of environment where there's a certain degree of comfort with that because there's, there's a respect for the other person. And it's the idea of, look, I, I think this really could be something, but if it can't, um, and, and, and I'll give an example of this. I, I remember, um, I, and I won't say who it was, but I remember talking with someone and, and kind of, we were talking about relationship stuff. And I, we had given the same thing where it was like, look, don't get physical. Don't get physical. Learn, learn how to understand and see if you can love the person for who they are, what they think, their, their hopes, dreams, aspirations, all those other things. Like really, really get to the bottom and the nitty gritty on, on what you believe, why, and what you want to do with your life and how you want to raise a family and build a family. And came to the conclusion that this wasn't, and, and, and we're, I'm not talking like came to the conclusion two weeks later. I mean, we're talking like multiple months of investing in asking these questions and, and whatnot. And, and some of this was during COVID, so it had to be long distance and over the phone and whatnot. But investing real time in it and coming to the clu- conclusion months later that, yeah, this just isn't going to work. And there wasn't all of this like animosity and heartbreak. Now, was there some feeling, was there some feeling of a little bit of, of rejection and disappointment? Yes. But because both of them had respected each other physically, you know, by not engaging in things that they shouldn't have. And because both of them respected the process that they were going through, right? It wasn't, we're going to get married one day, so let's figure all this out. It was, we both like each other. We have simpler, we have similar values. We have similar interests. Now let's figure out if if we can build a a relationship together. And what they concluded was they couldn't. And they parted as friends. Like there, there wasn't, there wasn't this heart wrenching breakup and rejection and all this other stuff. They parted as friends. There was no and, shame and or guilt of, involved. No, no shame or guilt. Both of them, and, and and I would go so far as to say that both of them were actually better off for the process that they went through. Right. And and this is an important thing to understand is that there are going to be people that you might think, oh, this is a possibility, and you're going to go through that process. And what I would encourage you to do is that if you can be upfront and honest with the other person that, hey, listen, the reason why I'm doing this and the reason why I want to ask these questions of you is because I am interested in you. And I think we do have shared values. And I'm serious about wanting to be, uh, I, I want to be a husband. I want to have a marriage. I want to build a life with someone. And I, and I would, and if, if you think that's something you're interested in as well, I'd like us to you know, be respectful of one and see if like this is something that we can find out. And you know what? That doesn't sound romantic to the world. Right, that doesn't sound romantic to Hollywood, but go take a look at Hollywood. Are any of those people living, yeah. or, or any of those people really living the sort of lives or marriages or experiences or raising kids, maybe with a couple exceptions here and there, that you would want to implement? If the answer is no, then don't buy the crap they're selling. Right, and and realize that what what you need first is yes, there's going to be those those butterflies and and whatnot, and that sense of vulnerability and getting to know somebody and and being honest with them about what you want and. And basically let them know that you potentially want it with them and opening yourself up to the rejection that maybe they don't want it with you. But if you can, if you can start off that process with, this is actually going to be kind of a fun exercise because we're going to get to know each other um, in, in ways that actually mean something. But if, if at the end of this, we decide that, hey, we're, we're not right for each other in this environment because we've respected one another both you know physically, emotionally, and the whole deal as we've gone through this, there's no need for us to like have you know, there's no need for us to have resentment toward one another. And I does think, I do think that actually makes it easier to kind of go through that, that process. And, um, because I think what you will find out is the more you're talking about these things and you have these discussions and, and when somebody, maybe somebody doesn't say something the way you thought they wanted, like, well, why do you say that? And then they explain it. It's like, oh, I've never thought of it that way. And in that, in that process, your whole worldview is being enriched because, you know, maybe you're finding out that you, you guys actually agree on all the fundamentals and now you're just figuring out what does that process look like to achieve what we want? And I, I know for, for Tina and I, we, we tell people this all the time. We had all sorts of ideas about, you know, what we were going to do and how we were going to raise our kids and how we wanted to educate them and things that we wanted to try. And, and there are so many things that have changed mm-hmm. or, or, or were forced to change by circumstances, sometimes because we came to the conclusion that we wanted to do something different or by circumstances beyond our control, right? We didn't start the war. (laughs) Um, But here's what we found. Because we agreed on the fundamentals and because we were able to identify, we were able to identify potential red flags or or cautionary things and talk through it and understand it. Because we were able to understand that there were no deal breakers. That doesn't mean that everything was ideal, but there were no deal breakers. 
what happened was, is that when we came to those points where we were going to change course, because we had had a plan and because we had had something of a roadmap, when we had to change directions, it wasn't some catastrophic thing. It wasn't something where I'm looking at, well, I didn't ever knew you wanted that, or I never knew you had that expect. We knew what the expectations were. And so when they had the change, we'd go through a process of explaining, hey, this is why I think this needs to change. And, and there was times where, again, we'd have to sacrifice or, or, or you know, make, but the bottom line is once we had made that decision that, okay, yeah, you're the one. People ask us sometimes, how do you know that person's the one? When I married them. <laughs> It, it's there, and there's something liberating about that idea that when, um, like, I, I knew I wanted to, I knew I wanted to marry Tina. Obviously, at that point where I, I asked her, and I talked to her folks. I think that's what people mean is, how did you know she was the one you wanted to marry? I think that's yeah, what they mean when they ask the question. No, I, I know, but like we went through, right. we went through that process of knowing that, you know, values, interest, attraction, and and wanting to build a life with somebody. Um. And then at that point where the moment it was, I do, I do like that was it. And, and what was, what was so beautiful about that is that all of those other, all of those other, you know, potential options of people you could have married or whatnot, like at that moment, that's all done. And now what you do is you get to focus on this whole new world that you are now tackling together with the person that you love. And it just, it, it's a, it's a perspective and mindset change that is just incredibly liberating in, in, in one sense and exciting in another sense and sometimes scary, but ultimately it, it's you two together. And that's the part where, again, the reason why we say go through these ideas of what are red flags? What are things to be cautious about? What are things to talk through? And then what are the deal breakers? What are the things where it's like, look, I know I can't build a life with somebody if this, this, or this exists, or we disagree on something so fundamental that it's going to ultimately impact the way that we raise our kids together or what, what we constitute as right and wrong or what we consider to be acceptable things versus unacceptable things. Um, but I, I, I guess the big thing I want to encourage people is don't, don't be afraid to have that. Um, but to get to that point, you got to know what you want or you got to have a good idea or you, you at least got to definitely know what you don't want, right? Got to have a good idea of what you want. You got to have actually put in the work to make yourself again, my goal is to make myself in, in many ways worthy of what, what Tina, I believe Tina wants and deserves in a husband, right? Working on those things, going into the environments where it actually makes sense that you would find somebody, right? It doesn't make sense to say, well, I'm just waiting for it to drop out of the sky. Like going into environments to where you're going to find those people, you know, d developing the kind of friendship that can then move into the sort of relationship where you're having these, these good discussions. And then ultimately that's what, that's how you know. That's how you end up knowing that this is the person I'm going to build a life with. And then when you make that decision, you just very simply, everything else, everybody else that could have been that person is no longer that person. They are not that person and that's it. And she's the one or he's the one. And the final question that we, you know, we wanted to address is, okay, it's all fine and good for Tina and I to say that because we got married in 1999. We got married in the 20th century right? and now it's the 21st century. Does it still apply? And here's what I would say. I think if you look at the full course of, of human history, you will find ideal times to, for people to find people and get married. You will find unideal times. You will find different uh, across time and space and culture and all these different things. And to this day, there are very different ideas of, of what actually constitutes a good process for finding someone that you're going to, you're going to marry. Um, I am I am willing to bet with with any sort of currency that you would you would accept that everything we talked about here today works, um, regardless of of the times and situations. Now, the degree to which you are going to find the, the, the what we would say in the military, the degree to which you are going to find a target rich environment may change drastically with what's going on in the culture and whatnot, and that may make things more difficult. And I, and I never want to suggest that things haven't gotten more difficult because I absolutely believe they have, but I don't think the principles change. It is unfortunate that the number of people that, that still believe in this may have been reduced. And, and I do think more and more people are recognizing that what they've been, the, the lie they've been sold doesn't work, but that doesn't mean the principles change. And so I, I would just encourage people that it, 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 it will be harder it may require a greater degree of, of vulnerability or frustration 
um, when you don't have a culture or, or a society that seems to reinforce the sort of things that you value and care about and that you want to foster and build in your own life. But like anything else, right? If it's, if it's worth it, if it's worth it to you, then you'll be willing to go through the difficulty in order to achieve it. And while I don't want to minimize the difficulty, I can absolutely speak for how worthy it is. That part I can speak about with absolute authority is that man, is it worth it? So I want to thank everybody. I, I know we've, uh, we've, we've covered a lot of things. We kind of jumped all around the outline and we, we always try to kind of go where we're kind of feeling like the conversation is leading and what what will be valuable to people. And, and hopefully this was valuable uh, to Kat again. Thank you very much for the question. And I hope that, um, I hope that we've done a, a credible job of, of answering some of the, the concerns or questions that you had and, and addressing it a little bit more from the perspective of, you know, that, uh, again, that young woman that wants to have that, that traditional relationship and marriage and wants to find the right guy. And we certainly hope that you do, um, because again, it is totally worth it. So once again, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, please consider joining Circle. Again, we'd love to go and get ideas from our, our community. We've got over a thousand people in there now. And speaking of Circle, and, um, speaking of Circle, uh, we have thrown around the idea of creating a singles tab, a <laughs> singles chat in the Circle chat, because if you're here and you're listening to this stuff, chances are uh, you've already been thinking about this stuff. You've already been doing this work and other people are also thinking about this stuff, doing this work. And Hey, maybe you might find them in circle chat in the singles tab. If it, I, uh, while, while we're, we're just, you know, throwing out, uh, you know, shameless plugs for things. Um, you know, we, we don't do this that often, like ever actually, but like if you've gotten all the way through the end of this podcast and you're on YouTube consider giving it a like or subscribing. I, I it, it takes two seconds. It costs you nothing to subscribe. I was looking at Nick's, um, Nick, Nick's figures today and it's like three quarters, like 75% of the people that watch his content aren't subscribed to him. So literally it takes two seconds. It's free. Um, I, I would love for him to get a million subscribers within like the next <laughs> the next couple of months. I think that we can hit it. So yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm to over here trying to be a matchmaker, and you're like subscribe. Well, I I have to throw it out because <laughs> and Hamilton will tell you this is true. I have to throw this out because Nick is never gonna shamelessly plug his own channel to his own audience. So somebody else has to do it for him. <laughs> That's true. Well, Liz, I no, Christian, I appreciate. It. I really do. And again, we we do appreciate our audience. We appreciate them participating. We love again. Both those who that watch, those that comment, those that actually join Circle and, and kind of go to that next level of, of just kind of, you know, forming that sort of community around the sort of ideas that we're talking about and providing input. Uh, it's something that we, we really appreciate. So once again, hope this was hope this was helpful. Please let us know what you thought. And uh, and again, if, if we do need to, and we've talked about this on two levels because we've had people come to us in the in the community and say, look. We, we like what you guys are talking about. We share the values and we are looking for somebody and Hey, this is a community where we might find them. So can you help facilitate that? And we've, we've actually considered that on a circle. If you think that's a good idea, let us know. And we will start to explore the next steps of doing something like that in a responsible fashion. Um, and then the other thing too, is that we've been, we've been pitching around the idea for a, a long time now of maybe one day actually doing some live events, um, and so if that's something else that you, you think that we should consider, please let us know in circles. So once again, thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next episode.